Welcome to the Invest for More Real Estate Podcast. My name is Mark Ferguson, and I am your host. I'm a house flipper. I flip 10 to 15 houses a year. I own 13 rental properties with a goal to buy 100 by 2023. I'm also a real estate agent. I've been licensed since 01. I run a team of nine. We sell close to 200 houses a year. So on this show, we like to interview house flippers, landlords, and the best real estate agents in the business. So stay tuned for some great shows. If you want more information on my rentals, on the numbers, how I buy properties, check out investformore.com. Hey everyone, Mark Ferguson with Invest for More. Welcome to another episode of the Invest for More Real Estate Podcast. Today, I'm going to talk about repairing property. So I had a really good email from someone kind of asking if I could cover this topic on my podcast. They want to know what repairs would stop me from buying a house. And honestly, there aren't too many, <laughs> depending on the numbers in the deal. But then I got to thinking I could also talk about repairs on rentals versus flips, how far to go, um, different price points, different markets. There's so many things to talk about in regards to repairs and how to best utilize your money when you're fixing up properties. So we'll get into all of that soon. Um, before we get into that, I just want to make a quick update. The book on negotiating real estate that has been submitted to Audible for quite some time. We're just waiting for that to be approved. For, so again, uh, hopefully that's available soon. I'm just waiting on them to give the final approval and and put a price on it and market it. We have no control over those um, things. And um, then also, I think I mentioned before, but I am going to be turning my um, fix and flip book into an Audible book as well. And then some of my other books too, we will eventually make into Audible audiobooks. Very popular choice for a lot of people. So trying to help as many people as I can, give as many different ways, you know, get that information out there. All right, so let's get into this topic, get going. First thing I want to talk about is when I'm buying a property, what do I look at as far as repairs? What scares me? What doesn't scare me? And really, I've been doing this for, what, 15, 16 years now. There's not too much that scares me as far as repairs because I know what they're going to cost. I have an idea of you know the seriousness of it. And if the numbers are there, if the profit's there, I will take on most projects. I don't want to demo houses. I don't want to build brand new houses and start from you know scratch. That's not something I'm looking to do. But as far as any other project, I'm kind of willing to take it on <laughs> as long as it's not a complete scrape. So I've bought houses that were completely gutted, had no walls, no heating systems, no electrical, no plumbing. Bought other houses that were in much better shape, but you still had to go through and tear down the walls, tear out the electrical, tear out the plumbing, tear out the kitchens, fix foundations. There's been all kinds of things we've had to repair. And I've seen, you know, budgets from a couple thousand dollars for some of my rentals, all the way up to a hundred thousand dollars for some of the properties that we had to completely redo. And I did recently finish a flip where we did an addition as well, which got up there close to that hundred thousand dollars. So when I'm looking at a property, there's a couple of things to consider when doing repairs. And I'm going to start with kind of the beginner's perspective. Maybe if you haven't done a lot of flips or a lot of rentals or completed a lot of renovations, what to look for. First thing to consider is the more repairs there are, the longer it's going to take to fix and the more money it's going to take. So even if you're using a hard money loan and you've got draws, you know, maybe you're financing 80% of the purchase price and 100% of the repairs, you can kind of think, hey, you know, it doesn't really matter how big the rehab is because I can finance all the repairs with this hard money loan. But it's still gonna be harder to qualify for those bigger projects with a hard money loan. They're going to have more questions and you have to be really good at estimating how much those costs are because most hard money lenders will want to, you know, no, is it 80,000 repairs, 60,000 repairs, 40,000 repairs when you buy the property? And they'll get it set up to take draws out. They're not going to give you that money up front. Once you complete the work, then they'll pay you back for the work you did. They'll also charge you to go out there and inspect it. So the bigger the job is, the more expensive it's going to be to use that hard money loan. And a lot of hard money lenders also charge you interest on the money for those repairs, even if you have not used it yet. So let's say you've got $60,000 budget for repairs. You bought the property for $100,000. You're going to end up financing $140,000 total with the hard money lender, maybe $80,000 for the purchase price. $60,000 in repairs are going to be financed as well. As soon as you buy that house, a lot of hard money lenders will start charging you interest on the entire $140,000. 
They won't charge you interest once you draw the money. They'll charge you interest whether you draw it or not. So the more repairs you have, the longer it takes. It's going to be a much more expensive project, even if you can finance those repairs. So you need to consider, you know, the size of the rehab, how long it's going to take, because it's going to take much longer. Um, the bigger rehabs always take longer. You run into more problems. It's going to tie up your money a lot longer. It's going to be much more expensive if you're financing. So for beginners, for people who haven't done a lot of flips, I usually caution about getting into a huge project that needs a ton of work. Uh, there's so many unknowns. It takes so much longer. It's so much more involved. It's much harder for your contractors as well. Um, there's a lot of things to consider. Once you've got some experience, you kind of work your way up, then maybe you can take on some of the bigger ones, but be very careful about taking on bigger ones if you do not have experience in the very beginning. I see this with my contractors all the time as well, where I have bigger projects. I seem to lose contractors or have to replace them during the job because, you know, a lot of them have not done huge, massive, you know, projects like that as well. And I think they underestimate how long it takes, how much it will cost. It stresses them out. It puts a lot of pressure on them. And if you have really good contractors, one way to get rid of them, <laughs> which you don't want to do, is to give them a huge, massive project. Everyone gets stressed out. Everything goes over the budget. It can be a bad situation. So you have to be really careful with those big projects. I still do them once in a while, but a lot of times once I'm done with them, I'm like, why did I do that? That was not worth my time. It was not worth the money, was not worth the headaches. I should not have taken on that project. So just remember that when you're in the beginning. And a lot of times you can't find those deals that are easy cosmetic fixes, but there's usually those in-betweeners that need, you know, cosmetics, some systems replaced, you know, twenty to thirty thousand dollar, maybe forty thousand rehabs instead of the, you know, sixty, eighty, hundred thousand dollar rehabs that just can really eat up your time and cause a lot of stress. So when I'm looking at properties, you know, I do consider that as well. You know, I've got a number of, you know, I've got private money, I've got my own cash, I've got bank money, I've used hard money before, I've got a lot of different financing options. And with every single one of them, it costs me more money to do a big rehab. And one of the biggest costs is the time it takes to rehab a property. So, I mean, we've had a goal to try and get everything done in less than three months on our properties, which includes big rehabs. And it almost never gets done if we take on a big project. You're almost always looking at, you know, six months, it seems like, to finish those really big projects. And if you're financing a property, that's a lot of interest that adds up. You need to make sure you're figuring that difference. If you're using cash, that's a lot of cash you're tying up that you can't use on other projects while you're doing that. So there's just a, so many things to consider when doing a big project. But that doesn't mean I won't do it if the numbers really work. <laughs> but if you're, if you're starting out looking for a flip, looking for a rental, I think the things that would scare me as a beginner are, you know, foundation number one. Foundations can be a $500 fix or a $15,000 fix, depending on what's wrong with the property. You know, a lot of times it's a simple grading issue where water is getting next to the foundation is causing some, you know, water leaks. Other times the entire foundation is, needs to be replaced that can be something that you really need to get checked out before you jump into a deal. If there's foundation problems and you don't have experience with foundations, get a company out there to look at it, get someone to check out what's going on. And there can be a huge difference in the costs of foundation work. I have a guy who's really good. He's actually one of my contractors, but he also does a lot of concrete work. You know, he's fixed a lot of foundations for us from five dollars to $10,000. It had pretty major problems. We've had other people look at our foundations when he was busy or we just want a second opinion. They've been twice as much for the same work. So it really pays to shop around, network, try and find good foundation companies because there's a lot out there that will just charge incredible amounts of money for work that doesn't need to cost that much because people just don't know any better. So you really have to shop around foundations, but th that can be a huge red flag when you're looking to buy a property. Mold scares a lot of people and it can be scary, but it can also be a very minor problem as well. So I've bought a lot of houses with mold. I've never bought a house that you know, was completely covered in black mold from floor to ceiling, but I've seen other investors who have bought them as well. And really, again, is you have to know what you're getting into. You have to know how serious it is. A lot of mold can be mediate, remediated, fixed by just cutting out the drywall and replacing it. Some mold can even have, you know, I don't know if it's bleach, but, you know, stuff sprayed on it. But you have to know what kind of mold it is. You have to know how serious it is. Again, we have a really awesome uh, mold guy who's local, doesn't belong to a big company, can go into a house, do a mold test for us, tell us how serious it is, and get rid of all that mold for us extremely affordable levels. I mean, if it's, I don't think he's charged us more than $1,500 for any job in the last 10 years. And most of them are a few hundred dollars. 
again, you get another company, you know, some of these national companies who are restoration experts, and they'll charge you five or 10 times as much for the same work because they, th they tell people how scary mold is. People don't shop around. They don't realize that they're getting ripped off. But try and stay away from the very big companies for mold remediation, environmental hazards. There's usually local people who are much cheaper. Um, this guy is certified with the state. He's licensed, can hand do it all legally. It's just he doesn't charge as much. That's, that's the only difference between him and the big companies. But again, mold can be super scary to some people. I think it's overblown. I don't think it's as big a deal as many people make it, especially the companies trying to sell you on their services to fix it. But again, get it checked out, figure out how serious it is. It's not something that would scare me away right away. But if it's a lot of mold everywhere, realize you may be tearing out all of the drywall. You may have to get, you know, dehumidifiers in there, treating, you know, studs, two by fours, maybe even pulling some of them out if it's if it's bad enough. But again, all that's fixable. You can do all of that if there's enough profit potential and room to cover that. Other things that we run into that can be, you know, not really deal breakers for us, but serious issues, electrical systems, you know, they can cost a couple hundred dollars to fix or five to 10,000 again, depending on how old the property is, how much work there is to do. There are plumbing issues where again, same thing, could be $200, could be 5,000 to replace the entire plumbing system. You know, Things to watch out for plumbing are galvanized pipes. Those almost always need to be replaced, the whole house replumbed. A lot of manufactured homes have really bad plumbing that need to be rebuilt, completely redone. A lot of things to look at there. You know, roofing systems, roofs are pretty straightforward, actually pretty easy to fix and work on, so I'm not worried about roofs. Windows you know, are pretty easy to replace, fix, once you know the costs. Structural issues are something that, again, usually comes down to the foundation, but when you're getting to really old houses, you need to look at with walls, support walls, um, sloping. There's a lot of different things that come into play with structure. But if you have a house that has super structure problems, that's something to worry about. You really need to get an engineer in to check it out and see exactly how severe those problems are. Another thing that can be scary are sewer lines, which I honestly do not check for before I buy a house, but have popped up recently from buyers doing inspections. And those can be, you know, a couple thousand dollars to $15,000 as well if a sewer line pops up as a huge expense. We see expenses pop up all the time that are more than we think. And when I buy a house, I'm always building in extra money to account for those extra repairs. But when you're brand new, you know, I'm doing a lot of flips, I can afford to pay more on some, less on others. That can be a little stressful. So the things to really watch out for before you buy a house, electrical, Foundation, you know, structure, plumbing, foundation, mold, meth can be something else that's a little tricky. You know, a meth house may have to be completely, you know, torn down and rebuilt almost in some cases. It's not always easy to know if you have a meth house unless you do a test. But some signs are just really bad smells. You know, it smells like smoke quite a bit, but not like cigarette smoke, like a chemically smoke. There's stains on the walls. Obviously, houses that are super dirty, not well taken care of with stains on the walls that smell really bad you know, can be um, signs of a meth house and something that you may need to check out. But figuring all this out is not easy in the beginning. Um, that's why I suggest people get an inspection. Even though I don't get inspections usually, I buy a lot of houses from a foreclosure sale, from auctions where I can't do inspections. If you're doing your first flip, if you're new, you don't have the experience, it makes sense to buy properties where you can do inspections. You can have someone come in, find the major issues, and give you an idea of how serious they are. Now, in my experience, just listening to your, your inspector is not good enough to decide whether to buy the house or not. If you figure out, hey, there's electrical problems, hey, there's plumbing problems, hey, there's, there's foundation problems, then you need to get the expert in who's an expert on foundations, on electric, on plumbing. Because those inspectors are meant to see an entire house, give an overview, they aren't experts in every single system. Some inspectors will over, overblow how serious a problem is. Some will underestimate it. So you need to get that expert in who can then tell you, like, how bad is the electrical really? You know, how much needs to be done? How bad is the plumbing? How bad is this foundation? So inspectors can scare you off or they might miss some things too. So it's a good idea to get someone else in there to confirm exactly how bad it is. And that's kind of the steps I think new people should take when they're buying houses that need work get an inspection done. Once you have the inspection, get another expert in there to figure out exactly how serious those problems are. 
then make a decision if it's worth moving on or canceling or what you want to do with the property. We'll help you save a lot of headaches. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt to do a sewer scope as well, which costs a little more money, but it's probably worth it. You know, just some things that can save you a lot of headaches in the future. Now, once you get experienced, once you learn how much some of these things cost, how serious, how major some of these problems are, then you can think about, you know, waiving your inspection, not having to get as many people in there in the beginning. That helps you buy more houses, get more deals when you can do those things, buy from more sources like the auctions, the trustee sales. It gives you a lot more flexibility. But you really need that experience to learn what to look for, what to watch out for in the beginning. Once you've bought a property, what you repair, what you fix can make a difference as well on, you know, whether it's a flip, whether it's a rental, how expensive it is and where your market is. So, you know, I've had quite a few articles on what to fix, some videos going through my properties on how much things cost, but that can vary in your market. So that's not, you know, a one size fits all. Every market's the same. Labor costs are more in different areas of the country. Supply and demand for contractors can push prices up or down. And then, you know, demand from buyers, if you're in a high end area, they might be more picky on what has to be done in houses versus entry-level homes. If you're renting a property, the renters are probably going to be much less picky than buyers if you know on the repairs that are made. So there's all types of things you need to consider. When I'm fixing a rental versus fixing a flip, I will not spend nearly as much money on the rental. And it's not because I'm trying to be cheap or save money. I mean, I am trying to save money, but it's because you don't need to do it. And you're also going to be holding that property for a while. There's a chance the tenant is going to do some damage, have some wear and tear on the property. So it doesn't make sense to make it absolutely perfect, spend a ton of money on it, and just have to redo it again, you know, every few years to get it perfect again. So when I have my rentals, you know, we'll replace the carpet or we'll put in different, you know, flooring depending on what's there. We'll almost always paint everything. We will, you know, put in new light fixtures usually. Sometimes we don't. Uh, Sometimes we'll put in new doors. Sometimes we won't. But we'll make the cosmetics look nice. We'll usually put in new appliances unless they're really nice already. But things that we normally do on a flip, we won't do on a rental. And we don't replace many kitchens on our rentals. We'll just paint the cabinets instead, unless the cabinets are just destroyed and broken. You know, most renters are fine with a decent looking kitchen. They don't need a brand new fancy kitchen. You know, if the has flat panel hollow doors, we may just keep those or paint them. We don't have to put brand new six panel or the, you know, colonial doors on there because the tenant's Really, they don't care as much. You know, in the bathrooms, if the tub is decent, the tile's decent, we won't replace all that. If the vanity's okay, we won't replace that. You don't have to go all out when you're fixing a rental up. It just needs to be livable, safe. Obviously, we'll, we'll, we will replace, you know, furnace systems. If they're older, we don't want anybody, you know, dying or, or getting carbon monoxide poisoning. Of course, we always have carbon monoxide detectors and smoke alarms in our rentals and flips. We'll usually add AC to our rentals because that helps them rent. That's a big renting point in Colorado is people want air conditioning. You know, if the roof is getting old, we will replace that because we don't want it to leak and cause a ton of damage. Hot water heater, of course, we want to replace that so it doesn't rust out and cause a bunch of damage. Electrical, we want to be safe. You know, plumbing, we want to work right. But you don't have to go all out on the rehab. You know, if the windows are older, we might not replace those where we would in a flip. So there's a lot of differences we do on rentals versus flips. In the, a lot of that reason is because when people rent, they're not buying the home. They know, you know, if something breaks, they're not responsible for it. It's, it's a landlord's deal. When they're buying a house and you're flipping a property, they will get an inspection done. They're buying that house. If something breaks after they buy it, they have to fix the furnace. They have to replace the windows. You know, they've got to do the roof. They want to make sure it's in great condition when they buy it. And they want to make sure it also looks really nice because it's theirs. You know, they're not just renting it. They can't move out in a year. They're going to be there a while. So they want to make sure it looks really nice. And that's why we spend the extra money on flips. We will replace windows. We will replace doors. We will replace kitchens. Most of the time, I think most of our flips we're replacing kitchens. We'll completely redo bathrooms. All the light fixtures we will do. Just spend a lot more money on the flips. It makes them easier to sell. And you'll get a lot more money in our market. Again, that can change from market to market depending on what price range you're in. Uh, we sold a $800,000 house this last year, a high-end flip that I wrote about, did some podcasts about. And when we first put that on the market, people were leaving feedback on how bad the remodel was. And it was the same as our low-end ones. I'm like, what's going on? Everybody loves our other remodels we do. But it was a completely different market, $800,000 houses versus two or $300,000 homes. And we learned that, man, you've really got to step your game up if you're going to sell that high-end house 
everything's got to be perfect. All the wood trim had to be restained. Um, we, you know, we had to fix a bunch of windows that weren't quite perfect. You know, put in some new carpet. Actually, we had mostly new carpet in there, almost new paint. But there's just, you know, it wasn't completely perfect, and that hurt us. So if you're in a, if you're doing high end flips, high end rentals realize you're going to be spending a lot more money on the rehabs because people will demand it. The low end stuff, you won't have to spend as much money, do as much to get those properties sold or rented. So that's, you know, a big consideration that I learned this last year (laughs) about doing rehabs. And then markets, you know, like I said, if you're in the Midwest and you're doing super low end rentals and everything else for rent, you know, is kind of marginal, not that great. You don't have to do a high end rehab to sell or rent it. Or maybe you do, if nothing's selling or renting, maybe you do have to do it to get people interested. But if you go to California and everyone's doing super high-end remodels, super high-end flips, and spending you know tons of money on the rehabs, you might have to do that as well to compete with them to get the same price. So what you need to do is look at your competition. What is the competition doing in your market, whether it's flipping, renting, what do you have to do? And a lot of that comes with experience as well. You know, you're not going to learn all of this before you do your first property, a lot of it is trial and error, and you don't have to be perfect. That's something to remember. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to do everything you know, 100% the first time. You'll learn as you go. You'll get better at it, learn different things to do. I, I still constantly learn how to do things better and differently. So it's not something where you have to stress about being perfect before you get started. It's, it's, this is something as far as repairs go that you almost have to start doing to realize what your market wants, what works best, what you have to do. I will see flips in my market that I think are done absolutely horrible. <laughs> they won't even replace carpet or light fixtures, but they still sell and those people are still making money. So there's not always you know one way to do things either. You just have to find how you like to do them, what works for you, and keep making your, your product better and better. As far as how to fix things, when to fix things. You know, I've talked about contractors before a lot as well, but I'll I'll touch on that briefly. You know, we've moved to a system where we try and sub out as much work as we can. It saves us a lot of money, does take some more time managing subs, but, you know, we sub out electrical work, we sub out plumbing, we sub out roofs, we sub out flooring, uh, we sub out paint sometimes, we will sub out foundation work, we'll sub out even windows, landscaping we'll sub out. Just the more subs we can get doing things, the faster job gets done because we can send multiple subs to the project at the same time. Whereas when we have one contractor doing everything, if they're doing windows, if they're doing roof, if they're doing foundation, they're doing plumbing, it almost always takes them longer because they don't have the, the manpower. They aren't always experts at every single thing like those subs are. You know, If you've got a contractor who can do 20 different things, are they going to be able to do those 20 different things as well as a plumber? who only does plumbing. That's all he does. Usually the plumber, if you find the right plumber, can be cheaper and faster than that contractor. So we'll use subs for almost everything. Have the contractor come in, you know, he'll replace doors, kitchens, baths, uh, maybe paint, maybe fix some drywall, put in fixtures. But that has worked really well for us. And I have hired, you know, my own crew as well this year. I've got, you know, one person we hired, another person we just hired. So I've got two full-time people, who are handyman can go out and, and do jobs and a couple of part-time people as well who can help out. And that's just been amazing. If you get to a, busy, a position where you're doing a lot of flips or a lot of rentals, having your own crew, if you can keep them busy is so nice. It's so much better than working with contractors. So I love it. But I think that's all I've got for this show. Repairing properties is tough. Working with contractors is tough. Knowing what to spend, how much to spend is tough as well. We didn't even touch on that on this show, but I've got a video I will link to on my YouTube channel that kind of has me walking through one of my recent flips, talking about how much it costs to rehab things. And that, that I think is really helpful. So I'll have a link to that in the show notes. Costs to repair can vary so much, you know, with contractors. Some contractors will be charging $100 an hour, some $30 an hour. Some will use super high-end materials, others not, others not. You know, we get almost all our stuff from Home Depot, save a ton of money with our Managed Pro account. You don't have to spend 50 grand on a kitchen. You don't have to do it. Um, A lot of people just, they go overboard with the repairs they make. You don't have to do it. Make it nice, make it livable. Most buyers are more concerned with price points and having a nice house that they can afford than having an extremely fancy house that's going to cost them, you know, 50 grand more than the house next door that's not quite as fancy. So, Probably gave you guys a lot of things to consider. 
a lot of things to think about. If you have questions, always leave me a comment below on this post and I can answer them for you. Or you can check out our the Invest for More Facebook page as well. And thanks for listening. Hopefully everyone has a great rest of the summer and we'll talk again soon. Thanks.